Hey everybody, welcome back. I hope you had a good break. Uh, it's a good news. You're welcome. Thank you. Praise God. Um, all right. Uh, let's just, uh, let's continue now. Okay. We are still in the notes of chapter four, uh, the power of praise, page sixteen. Right. So we we looked at the first uh, passage uh, that is Second Chronicles twenty. We looked at almost half the chapter, and. Uh, just understood so beautifully and so powerfully the power of praise, right? And everything, uh, you know, Jehoshaphat as a king and the nation of Judah and Jerusalem did uh, for this beautiful, uh, uh, you know, battle to be won and how they prepared themselves, how they came together with one heart, with one mind, uh, and how they sought after the Lord as a family, um, right? And, uh, and, it's just wonderful to see how God uh, you know, gave them the victory. And all they had to do, uh, do was fix their eyes on him, uh, fix their eyes on God and praise him and sing to him and, and be focused on his goodness. That's what they sang, isn't it? Uh, you know, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Uh, there was no major introduction, guitar intro, uh, leading into the verse one and chorus and a nice hook uh, for the song and a powerful bridge and a tag, nothing. It's just two lines. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. That's all they sang. And as they did, uh, God, the Lord set ambushes against men and they defeated each other they killed each other um so that's what we learned from that first passage uh right and then in daniel chapter 11 verse 32 as a cross uh in a text we see that uh those who do wickedly against the covenant he shall corrupt with flattery but the people who know their god shall be strong and carry out great exploits okay the people who know their god should carry out be strong and carry out great exploits right so one of the backgrounds of that scripture where daniel is writing is that when um it, so when uh, when antiochus uh antiochus uh, was one of the rulers at that time for greek and rome turned on jerusalem when he wanted to attack jerusalem the Jewish people were divided, right? Some forsook their covenant. They forgot about their covenant with God and they embraced Greek culture. But those who knew their God made a stand for righteousness, uh, you know, in, in the face of incredible persecution. Uh, some of them kind of come, you know, because, okay, you know, I'm going to just embrace the Greek culture and move on. But then that's what that verse means in 1132. But those who knew, knew those who know their God, isn't it, um, shall be strong. All right. Um, so from there on, um, so that was just as a side note, uh, you know, uh, which is an encouragement for us to uh, hold, you know, hold fast to the promises of God in our hearts and in, in our lives. Okay, uh, let's move on from there. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. Uh, Acts chapter 16, all the way. And uh, who doesn't know Acts chapter 16? Okay, let's take it from verse 16 onwards, okay? Let's go to Acts. Should be careful about which book I'm looking at. <laughs> right, Act 16. All right. Okay. Uh, I hope we're all there. Uh, let's read from verse 16 onwards, okay? Um, it says, Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we is Paul and Silas, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept us up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. 
Okay. Uh, again, uh, you know, I just don't want to. We all know what happened, right? Paul and Silas' story, Sunday school story. They sang, everything broke. Okay. We are not. We are not here to just learn that and move on, right? But uh, just a few, you know, like see, see the build up again for that passage is uh, Paul and Silas are now in Philippi. Okay. That's in in modern day. It's it's in Greek Thrace. Okay. Uh, it's in so. Uh, so that's what, very important for us to know that their geo geographical setting that they are in Philippi right now. Okay, and then they come across this girl. Uh, in other translation, it says uh, in the original translations, the text you see that she uh, was uh, possessed by the a spirit of Python. Pythonia, actually. Okay, Pythonia. Uh, what is it? It's it's just another name for one kind of a snake, isn't it? Why is that significant? Why should we know that? Is again, um, the Python was associated with the Greek god Apollo. Okay. All right. So where are they in Philippi? Where is modern day Philippi in Greek? Okay, and Python is associated with the Greek god Apollo. And in the region of Philippi, they also had a temple for who? For Apollo. Okay, so they also had a temple for Apollo in that region. Okay, so now it all kind of makes sense. It's like, oh yeah, you know, demons are very territorial, right? Evil spirits are territorial. Okay, um, and in a way, so there were there were certain men, uh, you know, who in acting like pimps. You know, like what do pimps do is they, you know, sell girls into prostitution, etc. Right. But they what they were doing here is they were using her for spiritual adultery. Right. In, in a sense. Right. So they were making money out of her. They did not really care for her. So that's the backstory here. OK. Of the spirit of what the girl is carrying. You know, the men behind them. OK. And then, uh, you know, in many cases, uh, you know, here Paul is like uh, Jesus, you know. Uh, you know, who, when every, every time Jesus came across demons, right, he, he oftentimes the demons will say, okay, you're the son of God, you're the most high, you know, why, why, why are you coming here? What, you know, like, for example, in Matthew 8, uh, 28, let's see, I'll paste the scripture. I mean, we all know that uh, we don't have to turn in the passage in your Bibles, but Matthew 8, 28, we know that, you know, scripture, uh, when he had come to the other side to the country of uh, Gerigenes, there met him two demon possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that one of uh, could not, uh, could pass that way. So that no, no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, "What have we to do with you, Jesus, the Son of God?" So they know who Jesus was, right? And Jesus doesn't really engage in a major conversation. This is like, okay, let us go go into the pigs. Uh, you know, just leave us alone. Jesus says, "Okay." That's all. Okay, that's all he does, right? And another scene, uh, you know, where we see in Mark chapter 3, uh, again, paste that for us. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, it says, And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Okay, so uh, why am I kind of saying that uh, is... I, I don't think Paul Paul really wanted, uh, uh, you know, endorsement from the devil, or an, you know, it's like, hey, you know, I don't need you to tell me who I am. I know who I am, you know. So we say, uh, it says, she uh, she kept doing that for many days. It doesn't tell exactly how many days. I, I might have missed it. Uh, she kept this up for many days. That's what my Bible says. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, finally, Paul became so troubled. He's like, okay, enough is enough. Okay, I don't care if you know me, you, you know. Uh, I don't need the evil spirits to tell me who I am. Okay, I know who I am. And then he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left. Okay, not one day after, not two days after that moment, the spirit left. So when the owners, verse 19, when the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, what their hope of making money was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the market. Okay, imagine all of this. Imagine you in that place. Okay, you're being dragged in the marketplace publicly, humiliating by your collar, dragging your feet is dragging the stone and the rocks and the mud and everything. Okay, your footwear, your slippers are getting cut, everything. I'm sure it's all a possibility. They dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. 
they brought them before the magistrates, before the government officials and said, these men are Jews. Look at their first comment, okay? These men are Jews. It is a condescending statement, okay? Uh, almost racial. And are throwing a city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept our practice. Okay, so that kind of tells that there was a, a small group of Jews already living there. And that's how they could identify by the way they dressed that th these men are Jews. Okay, like a small community, not big community. Uh, and once again, Greek, that region Philippi was uh, uh, ruled by the Romans. That's the word ruled. Okay. Um, and they're falsely accusing them by saying that they are turning our city into chaos. Everything is a lie, isn't it? They did not really create a chaos. All Paul did was delivered or set free a, a girl from the demonic spirit. Right? And then what happens? Verse 22, guys. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. Okay? Now, one of the things that we really need to understand is that... Um, it's strange that these people, uh, the magistrates, the government officials, and everybody who were attacking Paul and Silas, um, they did not know that Paul and Silas were actually Roman citizens. Okay, we'll we'll see that in the later part of the chapter. Uh, chapter, okay. But what's the significant about that? Okay, see, so, now, in the Roman Empire, there were two very different laws. Okay, one for a citizen of the Roman Empire. Okay, uh, and one were not citizens of Roman empires, okay? So Roman citizen had uh, specific uh, civil rights. They, they were, you know, it, it, it was awesome. Their civil rights were amazing, okay? If you, if you don't know anything about civil rights, uh, Google, <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, okay, civil rights are very important for you and me. As an individual uh, of, 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 of the place that where you're living in, uh, it's very important that tells you that you are the citizen of so-and-so place, you know, country and whatnot, okay? Um, so if, if, if you were a citizen of Rome, uh, you had certain specific and actually a very uh, privileged uh, civil rights that guarded you, okay? And non-citizens had no civil rights. If you were not a citizen of Rome, you were just another slave. You were treated very badly, okay? You had no civil rights, okay? Uh, you know, the, the government officials could do whatever they wanted to do to you and get away with it, okay? So... Coming back to this context is since they assumed that Paul and Silas, uh, Silas were not Roman citizens, they were offended that these Jewish men, uh, you know, how could they come into this Roman town that is uh, ruled by Roman and uh, create a chaos? And as soon as they got to know that they were Jewish, uh, more hatred towards them. It's like, okay, you are preaching about the God that we crucified. How dare you? Okay, uh, so this is the setting. So are you with me, guys? Okay, um, so everybody in the town assumed uh, just because they were Jewish, uh, they assumed that they were not Roman citizens. Okay, simply because they were dressed as Jewish, uh, as Jews. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, so the crowd joined, verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Uh, you know, as I was preparing and I was reading, right? I mean, even in the past. Now, again, just going back to the point where, you know, as we understand the importance of being a Roman citizen is that if you were a Roman citizen and if you were caught doing something illegal or something wrong, uh, you could not be, uh, you know, punished without being, uh, without going in for a trial. Okay, like in a court of law, you would be taken into a trial, and then you know, like a modern day judge scene. Once they, once they finalize, okay, uh, what you did is actually wrong. Only then you'll be thrown into prison or whatnot. So without going into a trial, there is no direct punishment. Okay, so I'm here wondering. 
okay was there no gap or time where paul could have said i am the citizen of rome in everything that was happening yes sure he was being dragged into the town he was being dragged you know beaten uh, um one part of me thinks that okay he must have not had any time or space to just say i am the citizen of rome or or the other th- part of me you know it is after this persecution his ministry kind of explodes so something tells me that you know i don't know i'm I just he must he must have had this prophetic moment where he sees okay because of th- this your ministry is going to explode and you know their lives going to be touched because of this persecution i don't know okay <laughs> but my question is why didn't he say it now because paul says it later absolutely why didn't you say it earlier he, that could have saved him from being beaten and flogged and stripped and what not okay um i just want to show share something for us okay um so and i hope you can see it i hope you guys can see it um this is just uh, an artist's imagination uh, of paul and silas but um, so what their feet what's on their feet is called stocks okay this is what it's called stocks so once again just look at our bible okay uh, verse 23 after they had been severely flogged they were thrown into prison okay severe now again just is pause and if you go back to the, the jewish traditions right if someone committed a, a sin or what not there was a certain number that they could be beaten 39 okay 39 lashes or whips that was the jewish thing okay and that punishment was called grace why because the 40th slash would kill you okay uh, but here in the roman punishment it doesn't say how many stripes they bore it just says they were stripped and beaten severely they were flogged severely we don't know if it was 39 or more we don't know okay uh, so after all of that they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them verse 24 upon receiving such orders he put them in the inner cell okay and fastened their feet in the stocks so this thing is called stocks okay um one of the historians says that you know these stocks unlike the picture it had more holes not just for two feet okay it had more holes that means their legs could be separated for more discomfort okay so uh just get a good glance of this picture uh because i'm going to stop sharing it okay everybody get a good glance of the picture all right okay so one of the historians says that that stock like i just said okay, it had more holes uh you know where your feet can actually be uh separated like parted so it's not just easy like it sees you know how their two legs just goes into the hole that's right in front of them another historian also claims that their hands okay their hands were pulled and also tied to their feet uh okay this is all so they are severely beaten they are stripped they are flogged okay it's these are not just words guys okay these are not just words that's there they were stripped okay let that sink in they were beaten we don't know how severely they were flogged now as if that was not enough they were thrown in a inner cell okay fastened their feet in the stocks and like one of the historians says you know it's possible from the punishments that was given in those days that their hands were pulled and also tied to their feet now if you know some grown men it's not it's not easy for your hands to reach uh, when you're sitting down like that right right when you're sitting down your you, your hands don't reach naturally so their shoulders 
were dislocated so their hands could be stretched and be tied to their feet. Okay, um, just touch your shoulders. Okay, just touch your shoulders. Okay, you see the socket joint there, it will be pulled out of it. Now, I've endured shoulder dislocation and uh, the pain is excruciating. I bought the hospital down. <laughs> okay, the pain is really excruciating. Uh, and uh, just to think that, you know, a historian claims that uh, based on uh, on those days, uh, facts uh, on punishment. That's their situation. Okay, now they've been falsely accused. That's one thing, right? People say the people uh, they're fa they've been falsely accused. They did not create any chaos. Secondly, they don't know that they are the citizen of citizens of Rome <laughs> yet. <laughs> okay, which they could have said, and you know they could have escaped all this embarrassment. But in all of this, through it all, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And other prisoners were listening to them. Now, the it doesn't matter, and I don't care if you are the world's best singer, if you're the winner of uh, how many Grammy Awards and whatnot. I don't think even the world's best singer would be in the mood to sing after being stripped and beaten and flogged and shoulder possibly being dislocated. Now, again, as a singer, right, uh, you know, one of the techniques is when you're singing is that you don't have a crunch stomach like this because you can't breathe and you won't be able to sing well. And from the image that I just shared, it kind of gives us an, uh, an, an idea and with the hands being tied. Yeah, that's not the most pleasant position to sing. Okay, let alone everything else that's gone about. That here we see that they were praying and singing hymns to God and other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a violent earthquake at the foundations of the prison and uh, the, that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Okay, uh, I'd like you to underline those lines. At once, all prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. So it was not just Paul's and Silas's um, chains that came loose. Everybody else who could, who were in the vicinity uh, of their praise, uh, their chains came loose. So there's so many points here, guys, for us to just highlight. You know, your praise is not for your own deliverance. Uh, you know, your praise is for the deliverance of people around you as well, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, and um, verse 27, the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and ab was about to kill himself. But he brought the prisoners, uh, but he, he, because he had thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Uh, we know the rest of the story, right, and how that ended. Um, so that, again, is just... Power of praise, uh, you know, it doesn't say what exactly he prayed, but I'm, you know, must have said, I don't know what to do, Lord, but my eyes are on you. <laughs> he could have said that, you know. Um, I don't know, I'm just saying. Um, but, wow. Uh, these are the sacrifice of praise, praise that costs you something. Uh, you know, the fruit of your lips. Uh, that's what Hebrews 13 says, isn't it? The fruit of your lips. It's not the fruit of your pastor's lips or your neighbor's or uh, you know, everybody else's. It's your fruit, your personal thing. It's very personal, right? Uh, offering, it's offering up 
the fruit of your lips for him. That is the sacrifice of praise. And that's exactly what's happening here in Paul and Silas's life. I don't want to go into the details later, but you can read the chapter for yourself uh, where Paul tells that he's a citizen of Rome and how everybody changes the, in, in their behavior and how they begin to treat Paul and Silas very nicely. Uh, that's a different story altogether. But, uh, uh, you know, in all of this, Let's just continue to ask God, pray, you know, to him. It's like, hey, uh, give us faith like this, you know, uh, in situations and in circumstances when we don't understand, help us understand the power of praise. Uh, you know, in our own natural eyes, uh, you know, we can gauge the circumstances uh, in our, just in our own ways, in our logic and in our understanding. But we need the insight of the Lord. Uh, isn't it? And uh, like that song which Tibia mentioned, uh, Surrounded, um, it's inspired by this scripture where Elisha and his, uh, you know, and, and his armor bearer, I think, he says, okay, we are being attacked by the chariots around us. And Elisha says, you know, we are surrounded. Don't worry. We, uh, you know, uh, we have more on our side. And then he prays, open the eyes of my servant, Lord. And he sees the chariots of fire surrounding them. Um, so we need to look at us. We need to learn uh, to look at our situations, our circumstances through the eyes of the Lord. Uh, and for that, we need to uh, pray. Uh, we need to ask God you know, to give us the faith and understanding so that we can see through every situation through his eyes. Right. Um, so that's that. And uh is everybody good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, before we move forward in understanding the shouting of praise, as mentioned in your notes, um, I again once wanted to uh, just share uh, some more details. Uh, you know, let's just do a. Um, more study on praise and warfare, uh, which is not in your notes. I'm just going to present this. Uh, give me one moment. Okay. Uh, whenever you're ready, Google Meet. Uh, I want to just uh, you know, dwell a little bit more on this topic of praise and warfare and understanding the power of praise and all of this. Okay, uh, this is not in your notes, and I will I will be sharing this PDF uh, in the stream section. So, if you want to make notes, you are most welcome to you know make notes in your own way. But I will be sharing this PDF on the class stream, so don't worry about it. Okay, um, yeah, is that okay? I just wanted to understand a little bit about a little bit more about uh, praise and warfare, and how uh, you know, just like as we read in Second Chronicles chapter twenty, uh, that King Jehoshaphat put the worship team in front of the army. Okay, uh, normal people would not do that. Okay, you don't put a bunch of musicians in front of uh, an army. But uh, Jehoshaphat does that, right? Uh, and time and time again, we see that the worshippers went carrying the Ark of the Covenant uh, before the army. Um, so frontline worshippers, you and I are frontline worshippers. And like I mentioned, you and I are born into a battle. You and I are born into a warfare. We don't have a choice. Okay, so... Uh, so just for just a little bit for us to understand uh, where praise and warfare is just a few points for us here. Okay, as worshippers, as worshippers, you and I will encounter resistance. Okay, uh, that's that's what Satan's plan is. Okay, uh, he he wants to divert our attention, take our focus, shift our focus away from God. We see that in Matthew four. And second point is because true worship reveals the Lordship of Jesus Christ and brings release of his presence and his power on earth. 
Okay, worshippers will encounter resistance because worship reveals the lordship of Jesus Christ. And the third point is because praise and worship are effective weapons of warfare used against the enemy. Uh, we, we, we saw Second Chronicles 20 uh, in Acts chapter 16. The other two, we'll look at it if you have time later on today. Okay, so as worshippers, we will encounter resistance. Uh, because that's the Satan's plan, point one, okay? He wants to divert our focus. He, he wants our worship. Uh, second thing is our worship reveals the Lordship of Jesus Christ um, in this realm. And finally, praise and worship are effective weapons of warfare, okay? So that is why, uh, you know, we, 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 will res uh, we will encounter resistance. Uh, but... As we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it says, The weapons of our warfare are not physical, weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Amen. Um, so, uh, the objective of this section is that uh, to provide a biblical framework and theology for the connection between praise and dethroning the rulers, authorities, powers, and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay, so that's uh, that's the objective behind this section. All right. So what we will learn is we will learn about our enemy uh, in just very briefly. Okay, uh, about our authority about our attitude that we are expected to have in warfare and uh, and our weapons for, of warfare, okay? Uh, if we are in warfare, I mean, it's a war, right? You're going to fight against an enemy, right? If you don't know your enemy, who are you going to fight and how are you going to fight, you know, um, et cetera. So that's one of the reasons why it's not to give him uh, too much of focus or attention, okay? We're not going to give the devil any focus or attention, okay? Um, but the Bible talks about him, so we'll just learn about him. But our authority in warfare, our attitude we are expected to have in warfare and our weapons for warfare. All right. Um, so that's what we will learn in this quick session. Uh, and once again, I will share these notes with you all. Okay. So let's go. First, the enemy. Okay. Uh, he is invisible. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents. Uh, these uh, verses are from the Amplified guys. Um, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. Okay, um, so one of the things is that he is invisible because he is not uh, in this realm. He doesn't manifest himself uh, in, in the physical always. Um, but that's the thing. So because our struggle is against an invisible foe, uh, most of us, many of Christians are passive. Uh, you know, uh, it's like, okay, we, because we can't see our, you know, our enemy, uh, we are like, we don't take him too seriously. Okay, it's like, I mean, imagine like Jehoshaphat, again, I keep saying this, sorry, uh, you know, the vast army from all sides are attacking. It's physical. You can see it, right? It's tangible and you will be scared. Uh, but this enemy, uh, uh, the devil that we are talking about, he's, he's more dangerous. And what makes it more dangerous uh, for us is that we are too passive as Christians if we don't take it too seriously, simply because he is invisible. Okay, so that's point one about our enemy. And the two, as mentioned in Ephesians 6 uh, and in Ephesians 2 here, he is a ruler of the kingdom of the air, right? Um, in which you once walked, says you are following the ways of this world influenced by the present age. Okay, that word influence is very important. In accordance with the prince of the power of the air the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, the unbelieving, who fight against the purposes of God. Okay, he influences, he, uh, he, he kind of uh, influences every kind of evil into this world. He is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. 
Okay, so one of the main areas of jurisdiction of the enemy is the heavenly realms or the kingdoms of the air that is beyond physical realm. Uh, the words we speak and sing have divine power to penetrate those realms, the invisible realms. Uh, that's the power of praise when we sing, when we lift our voice in fasting and prayer and intercession and worship. All of that has power to penetrate those uh, realms, right? So first thing is that our enemy is invisible. Our enemy is a ruler of the kingdom of the air, right? Uh, and finally, uh, our enemy is, an, is a, he is a thief, a liar, accuser. In John 10, 10, it says that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Um, Okay, he, he, just, he just doesn't come to break things. He comes into our lives to make sure all the good things that that's ever happened did not even exist. He wants to completely wipe you out. He wants to steal you of your joy, your happiness, your peace. Uh, and he wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. Okay, the physical presence of evil in the form of lust, uh, abuse, racism, greed, idolatry, just to mention a few, um, are merely an outward manifestation of the evil powers and spiritual forces over the cities and nations where things are occurring, um, where there is despair, divorce, spiritual blindness, immorality, murder, uh, you know, etc., etc., and every form of evil more often than not. He is the one who influences. He is out there to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the enemy, okay? But the Bible says we are more than conquerors. Okay? Someone say amen. <laughs> okay? The Bible says we are more than conquerors. Amen? So our authority... Uh, you know, that we are expected to have. Uh, our authority we have over all the power of the enemy is not an authority presumed or assumed. Okay? Our authority is based on the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Our authority is not just an idea that will make you feel good. Okay, and Luke ten nineteen Colossians. Uh, let me just share those scriptures for you on the chat. Uh, okay, All right, there you are. Sorry, I'm just trying to Luke ten nineteen and uh, Colossians two fifteen. Okay, Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Okay, behold, I have given you, I, Jesus, have given you authority. Colossians 2.15, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them in open shame by triumphing over them in Him. Okay, so our authority comes from where? Our authority comes from Jesus on his finished work on the cross. Okay, so it's not just presumed. It's not just a good idea. It is done. Amen. Um, so let's move on from there. Uh, okay, my computer is acting a little strange. All right. Okay, uh, third point is our attitude. Uh, God has called us to be his mighty warriors. Uh, you know, in Judges chapter 6, verse 12, we see that uh, God shows up before Gideon and he, he calls him as a mighty man of valor. It simply means a mighty warrior. That's how he addresses him, right? Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, we see that for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. All of that is important, right? So point one here is uh, we need to have 
an attitude of a warrior. Once again, reminding all of us that we are born into warfare. Okay. Uh, and if you're in the middle of a war, that means you're a warrior. Okay. You need to just remind yourself of that. And you need to have that attitude that you are a warrior for God. Amen. Uh, second point is you need to have an attitude of persistence. Okay. Uh, the Lord, your God will dry off those nations before you little by little step by step. We are gaining ground. You know the song, step by step. Okay. Um, with a persistent attitude, we will possess what God has promised little by little. Okay. We can't give up halfway through. Okay. And that's the attitude God is calling us for. And finally, our weapons. Music and praise is our weapons. Personal praise, corporate praise, instruments and shouting. Okay, all of these scriptures we've already read. Uh, that's why, you know, I'm just not going to go through them all. But we know it, right? Uh, personal praise, corporate praise, instruments and shouting. Your instrument is your is your weapon, okay? It's like you're saying, uh, but Roshan, I don't play an instrument. Hey, you have a voice. Voice, your voice is an instrument. Your voice is dangerous. It scares the enemy. Right, uh, every, can everybody see the screen that I'm sharing, right? Uh, the PDF that I'm sharing. Yeah, just a quick check. Okay, cool. Okay, our praise and worship is our weapon, one of the weapon. And next, we see God's word, the sword of the spirit, and prayer in the spirit. Okay, it is important to hear from God before going into war. Okay, uh, let's go to First Samuel. Can we quickly go to First Samuel chapter twelve, there, please? As mentioned in the notes, uh, these two scriptures I would like for us to read. And keep a finger in Second Samuel five also. Hmm. Okay, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 2, says, Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I am old and gray, and, and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Okay, let's go to 23. Uh, let, let's go to chapter 23, verse 4. Okay, chapter First Samuel chapter twenty three verse four says, before going into the battle. Once again, David inquired of the Lord. Once again, again that means he's already inquired before. Okay, so we see that in verse four. Once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him. Okay, uh, if you remember in Second Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat, uh, he said, it says, he resolved to inquire of the Lord before going into the battle. And we see that uh, David doing the same. What is he waiting on? He's waiting on the word from the Lord. David did not have the Bible like we do today, right? Um, so he was dependent uh, on, on the leading of the Lord. Let's go to Second Samuel uh, chapter 5. Second Samuel chapter five, verse nineteen. Okay, second cha chapter five, verse nineteen. It says, "So David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? With your, uh, will you hand them over to me?" The Lord said to him, "Go, for I will surely hand the Philistines over to you." Verse twenty. Okay, be, follow with me, guys. Verse 20. So David went to Baal-perazim, and there he defeated them. He said, as waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place will, was called Baal-perazim. Verse 21. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. Verse 22. 
once more the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Rephahim. So David inquired of the Lord once again, and he answered, Do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack in front of the balsam trees. As soon as you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees, move quickly because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as the Lord commanded him and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. Okay. Um, so David was dependent on the leading of the Lord from the word that came from the from God, right? He could have been over, uh, overconfident saying, okay, you know, every battle I don't have to keep asking him. But time and time again, we see that David inquired of the Lord. David inquired of the Lord. He went, he was dependent on the word of God. And I think that has something to say for us is that we need to be dependent on the word of God, right? Um, we worship and praise according to his word. Okay, Psalm 119, it says, Oh Lord, listen to my cry. Give me the discerning mind you promise. Listen to my prayer. Rescue me as you promised. Let praise flow from my lips, for you have taught me your decrees. See that? You have taught me your decrees. Let my tongue sing about your word, for all your commands are right. In Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Okay, Let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. In conclusion, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit then you will sing, then you will be singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourself and making music to the Lord in your hearts. Okay, the first two points we see that the importance of the Lord, okay, uh, importance of the word of God, uh, our weapons, our praise and our worship, our music, our instruments, then God's word is our other weapon uh, that we need to depend on, uh, to wait on his word, to read his word. Um, and then to be filled with his spirit. The obvious evidence of being spirit filled will be life overflowing with worship and thanksgiving. Because the father seeks true worshippers who will worship him in spirit. So it is the Holy Spirit that enables us, that empowers us to worship him in truth. Okay, uh, we'll get to that in, 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 in the next section. But as, as conclusions... Uh, musicians, singers, whoever you are, uh, you, you know, we need to be trained in warfare. We need to understand how warfare functions. Okay, yet realize that not every occasion of praise is one for war. It's very important for us to understand. And every occasion of praise is one for war. The Holy Spirit who often moves in seasons will from time to time emphasize the need for warfare and other times highlight other areas of restoration. Our sensitivity to the leading of the Holy Spirit will ensure we're doing the right thing at the right time. Okay. Um, So that is just uh, some extra, you know, study on on praise and warfare, just to give us a little bit more understanding on, on the power of praise and the weapon of praise that we uh, that we are all trusted with. All right, uh, is, uh, and that's the end of today's section. Uh, is, is everybody doing all right? Is it, were you able to follow along? Okay. All right, let's uh, quickly pray and we'll bring the session to an end. Okay. Father, we, we thank you once again for your word, Lord. 
we thank you for your Holy Spirit that uh, enables and empowers us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, I pray that the scriptures that we've looked at today, Lord, I pray that we will learn from uh, from them, Father. I pray that we will learn to fix our eyes on you like Jehoshaphat did. I pray that we will, in, in the most difficult situation and circumstances, I pray, Lord, like Paul and Silas, that you will give us the faith to endure and persist, Father, in, in worship, Lord. Through the hard times, through the difficult times, I pray that you will build our faith, Father, because you are the faithful one. We thank you for this opportunity to learn from your word. We submit the rest of the day into your hands. You lead us, you guide us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for joining in. Uh, have a lovely, lovely day. Bye-bye.